right, my friends. Uh, today, this is a different kind of a show. This is kind of another serious topic here, a uh, very timely topic. I know I've gotten a whole bunch of emails and comments asking about testing uh, in light of the virus. A lot of the testing across the country, and I'm sure probably throughout the world, has almost come to a complete halt along with all other social contact. I uh, just had a nice conversation with uh, Jim Teamstra from the AWRL. He's one of the uh, one of the 15 directors of the AWRL. So before we get to the interview there, I just want to remind you, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification right next to it. Please check out my Patreon and PayPal and, uh, you know, and consider supporting the channel because, you know, hey, these videos don't make themselves. With that, um, let's get to, uh, let's get to Jim. All right, guys, uh, with me to talk about today's subject because it is kind of timely. It is kind of important. This is, uh, uh, Jim Teamstra, K6JAT. Jim is the uh, section, not the section, you're the division manager for uh, the AWRL? Uh, director. I sit on the board of directors of the league. Uh, there's 15 of us in the country, and we, uh, we comprise the policymaking uh, body for the AWRL. As of late, because of uh, uh, the coronavirus, everything in the country is stopped, not just ham radio. I mean, <laughs> and some of the things that we would have never thought about before are actually now having a big effect. And one of those things is the uh, number one, increased demand for it. And number two, the lack of being able to take ham radio testing or VE testing. Um, what is uh, what's the league thinking? Uh, what are where we do? Where do we go from here? Yeah, that's a really good question, there, Bob. I I think that this is one issue that all the directors have been getting uh, calls and inquiries on through email and the like. Uh, so it's uh, we're very conscious of it at the board level, uh, not only because of this current crisis, but we've been working on improving our VE system at the league for quite a while now. You know, we have competitors out there, although the league has the greatest market share of uh, VE test sessions and uh, something around 75%. So, um, you know, we, we do a lot of that and we're dependent on uh, by a lot of people to get those tests done. Um, there hasn't been a complete uh, cessation of testing. Um, I'm just looking at some recent statistics I got that are about 10 days old or so from our uh, VE and at headquarters. And by the way, uh, headquarters is up and running. And uh, although there's nobody there, um, the entire league is operating remotely. Uh, the magazines are going out, the, um, all the email letters and everything are going out. Uh, we've got everybody set up uh, remotely and we've got, I think only about one person at each building. That's the warehouse, the uh, headquarters and the station. <laughs> And they're holding down the port, so to speak. But so we can still accept mail and things like that, and get some, and get some packages out in the mail to to members. But uh, they should expect some delays in that. And even the FCC, uh, I believe, has closed down their Gettysburg offices uh, for the time being. And they may still have some operations. In fact, I know they have some operations still going on at the commission in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jim. Can you explain for everybody right now the current process for VE testing? I know everybody that's got a license already knows it, but a lot of my audience are people who want to take the test. So what's the current process right now? Yeah, the, the current process hasn't changed uh, from what it's been typically of visiting the test site, having three VEs as proctors for an exam that's taken by multiple people. Now, that unfortunately is almost impossible to to pull off nowadays with the local uh, restrictions on social distancing and the like um, we've left it all up to the local authorities of course to dictate 
when people can meet and when they can't. And in fact, in some states, I hear that uh, two people getting together is too much and uh, not permitted under their local ordinances. So that makes it very, very difficult to uh, conduct an exam session. I believe there are still exam sessions in progress in some locations where there aren't the social distancing uh, restrictions taken to such an extreme. But those are becoming fewer and fewer uh, by the day. And pretty soon it's going to be very difficult to uh, put on an exam session. Uh, we haven't changed the rules uh, that we operate under because first of all, uh, we don't make the rules. The FCC tells us how many proctors we need and what kind of uh, proctors they are and uh, what kinds of controls have to be uh, in place over any given exam. And besides that, um, you know, the local authorities are now having their own uh, orders in place that are going to impact, um, impact whether or not people can actually show up and interact. So uh, that leaves us in a tough situation. We've been working at headquarters for a while now on actually upgrading, updating the whole process and making it more electronic. And um, we've actually even begun uh, looking into doing it entirely by remote. But uh, we're in the process right now. Unfortunately, this hit us right in the middle of that process in which uh, we were well on the way to getting a contractor to, uh, to help us implement remote testing. And that uh, whole process has ground to a halt. In fact, it wasn't uh, projected to actually be completed until the beginning of next year. Uh, because there's quite a few steps, as you can imagine, including dealing with the FCC. So um, uh, we might look at trying to accelerate that process, but it's, it's a long and complicated and difficult thing to do. But as I said, we've already been, been trying to start that out. Um, the league in the past has been very successful with remote testing in very limited circumstances. I don't think there's any other uh, VE who's actually conducted remote tests at this point. If there is, we'd love to see what they're using and how they're doing it because we would uh, we want to investigate all the approaches that are available. But um, the league does have the Anchorage, of course, the Anchorage Alaska VE that uh, does operate remote testing, which is uh, very, very limited to a couple applicants at a time mm -hmm. and, uh, and highly uh, uh, difficult in terms of the uh, hurdles they have to jump through every time they they give a test. Uh, but we've also done it in Antarctica. We've gotten waivers from the FCC to do it for a remote island in Hawaii. I think once in Japan, maybe we even did one on the International Space Station, but that's just sort of in the back of my mind I, that that happened once. But um, we've had them give us waivers before. Uh, but the problem with that is in this circumstance, what are you asking for in terms of a waiver? You say, we want you to uh, immunize us from uh, contracting the virus or giving it to somebody else or being responsible for somebody getting the disease. I mean, it's a, it's a touchy liability issue right now um, to do anything that runs contrary to the local orders. Are clubs and organizations right now banned from doing testing sessions? No, not that I'm aware of. There's no a rule or a ban that's been imposed by the league. There's no ban uh, that's been issued by the FCC. As far as I know, the only restrictions are based on local orders to shelter in place or social distancing. Okay. And have you seen since the, uh, uh, since the outbreak of the virus, have you seen an increased demand or people asking to take the test? You know, I've heard about it, but it's all been sort of uh, uh, by word of mouth, hearsay. I, I haven't had any calls directly. Uh, usually my, my calls come in often from the SMs, the section managers, and they'll tell me, oh, there's this concern that cropped up. You know, Jim, what are, what's the league doing about it? Um, you know, are we going to be able to give them an answer, et cetera? I know my East Bay section manager asked me a few weeks ago about the problem, and I directed him to uh, the latest uh, news bulletin the league sent out on the subject was um, in the, 
I guess it was the AWRL letter from uh, March 19, and there was some information there, but it wasn't uh, anything that, uh, uh, you know, would give people a lot of comfort as to what might happen in the future, because um, as I said, it's a te technically very, very difficult thing to address, and we can't run afoul of what the FCC will let us do or not do. Um, I know there are some directors who have access to remote testing uh, processes, mostly that exist in connection with other licensed services, other, other, even I think maybe radio services. I haven't looked into it deeply, but um, they're not really scalable to our size because we put on so many tests. And what you're talking about is a wholesale desire by a lot of people to go out and get their amateur radio licenses right now. And yeah. it's going to be really, really tough to accommodate that. How far away are we from getting the FCC to buy off on some alternative testing method uh, other than having a bunch of people sit down in a room and, and be proctored by, by three VEs? If we have the three VEs on site and, and we could reasonably keep everybody at the safe distance, you know, what, what else do we need to do? Well, actually, I think under those circumstances, you could still hold a test. If you're in a location where they don't have a social distancing order that requires, say it's fewer than 10 people. I know some jurisdictions it was like that for a while. Um, or five people, whatever. You could literally still hold that test, I think, under the regular rules with the proctors doing their job. Um, and just keeping the distances at the minimum required. Uh, that's not the real problem. The real problem is as this clamps down more and more, does it become impossible to comply? And then the question is, how long are we stuck with that? Well, that's the multi-million dollar question, isn't it? Everybody's waiting to see how yeah. long is this gonna last and how long. We're not going to get a solution for remote um, test taking, in my opinion, and this isn't the opinion of the league, but in my opinion, it's not going to happen within the time frame they're talking about for bringing things sort of back to normal again. Three months, four months is too short a time to go through an entire restructuring of the process that would satisfy everybody and then by then, you know, allow it to happen in circumstances where there's a lot of social distancing. We might, who knows how long this will last. We might have to do that anyway. Yeah. But at some point, if we're still trying to do our electronic, our project for electronic remote testing and get it done by the beginning of next year, I think that would be a real win for everybody. Yeah, I, I think that would be, uh, that would be something that the, uh, that the league would want to put on the very front burner because from what I understand, there's a good chance of this coming back or something like it coming back in the fall. So yeah. we'll be back in the same, we might be back in the same boat here. A uh, couple more questions on this. Uh, right now, is the ARRL still processing applications if, uh, if a club or an organization gets an application in? Yeah, I, I believe they are uh, to the extent possible remotely. And I think we do have a pretty good handle on doing it remotely, although some of the, some of the, you know, filing and uh, maybe hand processing or mail aspects of the process are delayed. But uh, that was a point I wanted to make in all of this, that, you know, putting things in priority. Um, the league's been under, you know, has been in an extreme crisis management mode, as you may imagine, for the last few weeks. We went from having, uh, you know, an up and running hundred, you know, person operation at headquarters uh, nearly overnight just dissolved on us by an order that said in 48 hours you have to shut everything down and leave the building. That's hard to cope with and and I yeah. gotta hand it to staff has been fantastic in their ability to adapt, get electronics out to the people who needed it to work at home. Go, our IT people went around to people's homes and set things up for them and made sure they were working. I mean it's just amazing. I, I'm really proud of the the staff of the league right now for doing all that. Well, two more questions. Is the FCC still processing applications uh, from the league? You know, 
it's, it's funny you ask that. As far as I know, they are. But I have been told, and this is, again, a rumor. It's not something that I know as a personal matter, that because of the shutdown of the Gettysburg offices, they have some um, functions there that they can't remote. That's what mm -hmm. I've been told. So um, take that for what you will. I mean, last time we checked, things were going through, licenses were being issued, but this is a day-to-day -day, uh, situation. And uh, for all we know, as of this week, they can't process anything new. I don't know for sure. Okay. And are is the FCC able to uh, do renewals? And what happens if somebody's license happens to expire during this whole thing? Yeah, that's a that's a very tough question. I don't know about the renewals. I haven't heard anything on that subject at all. Uh, they were being done, as I said, but um, how long ago? I don't know. Uh, it's tough. Maybe they could issue a separate rule, but I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll talk to our general counsel who has regular conversations with people over there and see if that's something he knows anything about, whether they've got a way to do renewals just, um, automatically or, or, or maybe just a, a waiver or something. I don't know, uh, for the duration of the emergency, but we can see. No, no harm in asking. <laughs> yeah, I want to switch gears here. Something to a little bit more fun, but yet uh, it, just as serious. Field day. Uh, what does the what does the AWRL have as far as a plan B in case this is still, you know, going on uh, when we hit June here? Yeah. Well. I had this question come up uh, from another section manager just a, a week or so ago, and yeah, people are starting to get worried about that, even though field days, uh, well, it's a good couple months away yet, uh, two, two and a half or so. But I know that that's coming on fast, and, and you know they say this problem is still ramping up. So the league's current official position is that um, we're gonna go forward with field day as usual, and that field day is a uh, emergency preparedness um, exercise. Always has been, and that we should treat it that way, uh, especially this year, and see if the clubs can not come up with some imaginative ways of dealing with their local um, ordinances and stay-at-home orders and uh, social distancing, if it still is in existence at the time. And uh, the rules, I think, are flexible enough that they allow for, uh, if I had one ham ask me, well, what do you do for uh, somebody who wants to work from home? Well, I said, there's always been categories for home stations, right? station class D or an emergency power class E. So, you know, you could always do it from home. But, uh, and, and he just didn't know that because he had always gone out on field day in the field and, and that's the way they did it. So, yeah, right now, and if you, I think the latest statement of what the league's, um, uh, what they were suggesting on that score, what we're suggesting is in the uh, AWRL letter from just last uh, Friday, uh, March 27th, there's a uh, article in there called A Time to Adapt, and it's about Field Day 2020 for more information. Okay, okay. Um, let's see, if, uh, if clubs can't get together for Field Day, how are we going to address that thousand foot rule for club point totals? Well, yeah, you got a couple of sub parts there. Um, you know, point totals are point totals, but it's not a contest, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what we always say. It's not a contest. And um, so point totals are, are, are more or less uh, valuable. And generally it depends on the club and how it views its field day. Some of them take it very seriously as a, as a contest and, and others don't. Some even take it just as a social get together. So that might be a problem this year. Um, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no current uh, discussion about the thousand foot rule. Generally that actually rule changes for contests and ARRL on air activities do often get the board's uh, direct scrutiny because we like to, uh, consider those as uh, central to ham radio activity. And 
nothing's come to the board on changing the rules yet. Now, there are people looking at the rules and seeing if some accommodations need to be made or can be made. But again, you know, we're in that state of flux where we don't know what things are gonna look like by the end of June. And so, you know, what can we do? It's a lot of effort uh, to change rules on any of our uh, activities, uh, as you may well imagine, because there are many different opinions on what the rules should or shouldn't say. Oh yeah. No, I, I mean, I know my club, we go, we go through that rule book every year and it's, it, there's always another something to, to deal with. And I think this year is going to be a big thing. You know, we're trying to decide, do we keep the planning stages? Do we, what do we do for field day? And, uh, you know, my personal opinion, uh, if there's any other field day chairmen or, or whatever out there is, it's, much easier to stop something at the last minute than it is to try to get it jump started. So, well, and and you know the on-air activities are very very important, especially in times like this. And I'm pretty certain there will be a field day no matter what. What it looks like may vary. I know a lot of people are operating in various contests and things like the CQ contest this past weekend. Lots of stations were on the air from their home, but I noticed myself that there was nobody in the Caribbean. And I thought, oh yeah, that makes sense. Nobody could get on a plane to fly to the Caribbean to set up a station to operate. So it, it, there's good and bad. There's a lot more stations at home entering and spending more time at it. Yet on the other hand, there's uh, some things that can't be done. And we'll just have to balance the two of those. Yeah. Um... Jim, anything else you could think of or anything uh, you want to you wanna get across to the five or six guys that might be watching this? Yeah, well, I would, I would say, hey, guys, you know, enjoy ham radio while you've got all this free time. Uh, best hobby on earth, of course. And I think uh, be safe is the uh, real watchword because we're all trying to uh, keep healthy and, and alive. And we're probably mostly in that uh, more vulnerable group, uh, given the age demographics of the ham radio population <laughs> at the moment, including myself. And so, uh, you know, we're trying to watch out. And uh, as I said, just be safe out there in 73. Guys, I hope you enjoyed, uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. I know it was long, uh, but you know what, that's, uh, that's really what the AWRL has to say about VE testing right now. Uh, take that for whatever it is and, uh, and the upcoming field day for this year. Anyway, guys, uh, again, if you enjoyed the video, please give it the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, the bell notification right next to it. Check out my Patreon, my PayPal, uh, consider supporting the channel. And if you have an email question, there is the email. I'm Bob, K6UDA, and I'm out of here. 7-3.